before we start, uh, kind of uh, open house uh, is a huge effort uh, for the school, a very joyable uh, kind of, it's a joy to do this. It's a moment to open the school to many people, like many of you that are coming here to, uh, to be with us today. But it's a lot of work. I want to thank Stefan Bodeker and Kendra, who is around, Ilana, and, and the faculty that contributed to that, uh, uh, to this, and the uh, IT team and AV team and everyone. It's, it's a lot of work and it's, it's great. Uh, but we also are here to, to celebrate uh, Hilary Sample. Uh, and to, to discuss with her her work and to, 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 to actually uh, learn more of what you've been doing uh, in the last years. And I'm incredibly happy that this can happen during this uh, open house uh, lecture uh, today. Uh, and, and actually you gave the 2016, right? Uh, open house lecture. So there's been a long time since last time you spoke here. Uh, and it's a great opportunity. Hillary is the IDC Foundation Professor of Housing Design and coordinator of the housing studio at GSAP, uh, where she began teaching full-time in 2011. Uh, she's an architect, a researcher, a teacher, and an intellectual, I would say, a critical activator in many different ways, uh, and committed to many different causes and, and, and sensitive to many things that happen to architecture and as architecture. Um, and along with Michael Meredith, Hillary is the co-founder of the New York-based architecture and design studio, MOSH. Uh, I actually have, I'm so glad that we can work, uh, like uh, uh, celebrate your work, uh, because I think that there's so much that is happening in this transitioning from research, design, teaching, and sort of activism. And, and I think that it's often something that because we look only at what part of Moss work or, or your research and your books we, or your teaching we, we missed. And it's probably a good opportunity to see how these things are traveling from one of your activities to the other. But on a personal note, I remember very well the first time I, I saw your work in 2004 in the Tate Modern, in the exhibition that was dedicated to Pierre Wick, Pierre Wick celebration. And then there was this amazing puppet theater uh, with Le Corbusier, the tiny bird, and all these beautiful things. But I could not stop looking at the, what was surrounding these amazing characters and was this puppet theater that it took me a while to find out that was designed by Moss. Uh, these very young architects at that point, actually 2004, it was a year after you 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 founded your your office, and I was then then kind of trying to find information about Moss Moss. Who's these people Moss that did this theater? Who's this? Where's this theater? And then I found that that this theater was temporary, so it was no longer there. I remember I traveled to 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 the GSD, and I at the first thing, where's the theater? The puppet theater? What puppet theater? And then the carpenter center has this puppet theater, and then it was. Not no longer there, but it was everywhere else because Pierre Way was making it very visible. Uh, I think that your work is actually something that it's also transforming the geographies of architecture, inter operating as an international this architect and working uh, in a connection with New York and Mexico and working in tiny towns in the north of Europe. And then it's sort of reconstructing what being a planetary architect means, not necessarily in Hong Kong or in, but, but kind of a different geography of little towns, places where things are happening, where you're doing your schools, the school number one, the number two, the number three, the, and the houses. And, the, and I think that's also something very important. In an interview uh, in Madame Architect in 2020, you said uh, that you fall, you, you fall more in the model of a starting a practice by doing small scale things and building up. Part of keeping Moss a small office is for me to truly work at some capacity on each of the projects carefully and in intently. And to think about the work as a whole. We think about our work as a body and a collection of things that are not unrelated. And I have the feeling that we were talking about this now that in your work, uh, being small or big is actually not that much of a difference. You, you pay attention to the tiny rock that it stands by the house number 15, I guess, in Chicago. Uh, as, or the bicycle as much as to the big building. And I think that that's actually something that speaks of how you see architecture, something that is a continuum probably of many things that happen and that helps shape in people's lives and society's lives. You've uh, received so many awards of recognitions. I have the long list. I will read some of them, but sometime probably I got tired and I won't stop. I will stop. 2013, the American Academy in Rome. Um, 
uh, in 2015, the National Design Award in Architecture from the Cooper Hewitt uh, Smithsonian uh, Design Museum, the Holcim Award for Sustainable Construction as a uh, Asia Pacific Region. 2014, the Krabbe's Hall, uh, uh, Hall School in Denmark, uh, the AI New York Excellence Award. In 2010, American Academy of the Arts and Letters Architecture Award. In 2009, the you won the with After Party, the MoMA PS1 Young Architects Program. In 2008, the Architectural League of the New York Emerging Voices Award. In 2006, the, the McDonald Artist and Adam Studio. Uh, well, so many things I, I will stop here with, the, but because I also want to talk about your books. And what is for me very unique is that Hillary is working in different registries, in different languages, in different kind of realms to a certain extent, developing a very different voice in each of them and something that the connection are not so obvious and you have to dig a little bit to understand how things connect and that's that's actually the beauty of that you 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 uh, identify what's the specificity of each medium and you're working there differently and your book 2015 questions concerning health the stress and wellness wellness in johannesburg that was connected also with your teaching um uh was raising questions concerning health and reports on public health and cities that became more and more important actually that was opening a conversation during COVID here at the school that you you help uh, organizing in 2016 maintenance architecture with mit press was actually a big way of transforming the way we could approach buildings looking at the detail of how things are uh, uh carried through time and care and it was including already uh, uh uh, a concern about caring as a source of architect for architectural design, uh, aligned with many other discussions that were happening. And I, I was thinking that that was actually happening simultaneously, probably to the work of Maria Puig de la Bellacasa, that was uh, announcing that in the future, uh, designers would be uh, dealing with matters of care. And, and that was sort of premonitory of that. With Moss, you did so many books. Uh, I think the, the, the croquis that, that, that was dedicated to your firm uh, was actually quite quite amazing in many ways. The uh, uh, 2018 unfinished encyclopedia of scale figures without architecture that was first presented in the Istanbul Biennial in the form of a curtain, uh, and then in the Venice Biennial, and there was uh, kind of bringing all these doings in life and and acknowledging the agency of those and how the questions of representation were very much happening through the language of architecture very specifically, and that that was. Uh, Really excited to see also how it became part of Princeton now, and it's the 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 background for all the discussion right happening there. Uh, in 2018, uh, 44 low resolution houses in Princeton uh, School of Architecture that was also an exhibition. 2019 houses for scale. 2021 vacant spaces, looking at the way uh, the city was transformed by the the way things were moving online. 2022, a book on uh, making a, a petite call, which. Uh, also brought together many people to provide input on on pedagogy to as part of the architecture. Uh, I love the way your work as designer is organized bureaucratically. Like I already mentioned, house one, two, three, four, five. I, I actually was concerned that I was missing some of them, but you're in house seventeen right now at this point, man. And school I should probably run right in school number three, I think. On the uh, but I also want to say that your work as activist was uh, very important for me. I think your your women writing event series that you organized here was actually giving a voice to a number of designers and beyond that were women that were writing. And actually it was something that was connected to your experience. You were mentioned in an interview also, Hillary, that you when you started studying in Princeton, it was very unlikely to find designers that were women and those that were women were often asked to be strong and write them that uh, that was something that you were trying to find an alternative to. I also want to say that I love this beyond building uh, uh, objects, design things other than buildings, I would say, uh, more than buildings, I would say even. And I remember in the, in the Chicago Biennial how beautiful it was to see all these constellation of objects around the house that were accounting for actually many, many things, many other technologies that are needed for houses to work. That was actually challenging the notion that architecture is this kind of strong arc, uh, 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 technology that imposes itself to any other form of, of technology and scale. So with this, I think it's a great moment to start a conversation with Hilary. I would uh, encourage everyone to take notes uh, and we will continue that uh, uh, with a debate afterwards that is open to everyone and hopefully very much participated by this very, very vibrant uh, uh, environment. Thank you very much, Hilary. Please join me as open.
Good evening. Thank you all for being here. And thank you, Andres, for the wonderful introduction. Um, it's been a while, yes, since I lectured here. Uh, so, I mean, I, I do it weekly, but this is a different matter. Um, I wanted to um, maybe start with uh, some thoughts around, uh, yeah, I have to click my thoughts here, I guess. But um, it, it, in some ways, it's maybe a little uncomfortable for me to give a talk uh, alone in some ways, because I'm always doing my work uh, with others. I think Michael and I uh, have built this practice over the last, yeah, now 20 years. And we are always saying that um, we do this conversation together or that we're never uh, less than two. So I think for me, that also has become very important in um, everything we do um, and also um, in you know, thinking about that role as an architect and designer, um, because it's a very different kind of space than when I was a student. And when um, I was uh, asked to, you know, start to think about working as an architect. Um, so I, I very much think about this all the time, that we're constantly in conversation. And um, that that conversation also is not uh, so uh, private and um, that it's become maybe more public. And we're really interested in that, that the space that we work in and the kind of work we do um, is done with other uh, people all the time. Um, and I think this is also one thing that is more and more underpinning the work that we're doing. And I think what's so special about architecture and important about our work is that it's obviously an art and many of us are working in that way. Um, it's obviously science, but it's also service. And um, I think to be able to uh, work in this way is kind of an exception. Um, it, it's, we can think of other professions that are serving the public. Um, journalism is one way, for sure, is an interesting conversation I had relatively recently about the role of journalism and um, that Journalism is maybe very close to architecture and that journalists have ideas, um, but it's only after going through a kind of process of interviewing or talking to a public that the ideas are transformed into other ways to serve the public. Um, I, I don't know what this means exactly in terms of a method for architecture, um, but it's definitely something I've been thinking a lot about uh, and how we um, how we begin to work. and. So um, some of the ways that we're, you know, we're thinking about architecture um, go goes through a different process. Let's say we, our way of working starts in, in different ways depending upon projects, um, but we're, we're, we're always working at this kind of similar things. And so writing, um, we, we always in a way start with writing um, as much as we start with drawing. Um, and I think it, it uh, think about ways of collaboration has become more and more important to the, to the way that we work. Um, so collaboration in the case of, let's say this project I'm going to present around education, um, collaboration for the sake of collaboration and trying to do more of that in our practice, um, and collaboration around making, I think these are the kinds of themes I wanted to present mostly for, uh, for this evening. And, you know, this um, sort of start with this project. Um, this is a, a school for um, students that are between high school and university. Uh, this is in Denmark. It's um, a little bit north of Copenhagen in a town called Skive. Uh, we were invited by the director, Kurt Feinstein, to reimagine uh, studio space for the campus. Um, so he asked us to both look at the idea of making new studio spaces uh, and also to uh, think about the master plan for the campus. So it's a, a kind of small, small campus uh, and there were existing buildings um, and he wanted to see if it was possible to repurpose those buildings. The challenge was that he also, at the same time, along with the faculty, uh, were 
asking us um, to think about possible futures for four uh, different kinds of disciplines, art, architecture, uh, photography, and graphic design. Um, and could we um, think about uh, the way that the students would work that would give them new possibilities for making, but also um, what he was also saying, maybe not so explicitly, but was that this, the campus was bifurcated and the students weren't engaging each other as much as uh, the faculty thought they could. And how, how might that be possible? Um, so to really make a, a place that could be about um, interdisciplinary work. Um, and so um, looking at uh, the existing and thinking about uh, these new studio spaces, also in the context of uh, the campus design, which he had already worked with. Uh, this is a house design, guest house designed by Jorge Pardo. Um, and some studies. Um, here, looking at how to expand the existing buildings. But it was really important to us that when we were thinking about how students would work, that everything on the campus was very internalized. And it's a very beautiful campus. It's between a body of water and a forest. So we also were thinking about ways to be part of nature and to just try to make new spaces uh, that the students hadn't had experienced before. Uh, it's not really a traditional campus. Um, and so we began by these very uh, forms that were repeated. Um, often we, we do like to repeat things in a kind of repetition. Um, and um, ultimately seeing that the buildings being so low um, and very dark um, weren't really a kind of way that they could think together more broadly. Um, so we proposed that instead we would make something separate and that in the case of the studios, by pulling out these buildings a little bit from them, they could still use them and then use this space, but use them separately. Um, and that's kind of one idea we had. Um, all of the studio spaces then um, are really kind of open space, but by their nature of coming together, um, produce open courtyards and then these other shared uh, spaces and that are covered, um, spaces that are, are not like anything else on the campus. Um, we made a small booklet um, as part of the, the work. This comes together at the end with photographs, but we... We work a lot, as Andres was saying, in books, and um, always, uh, for me especially, I feel I'm always thinking about the idea of a, of a book, something in addition to the building. And this comes on, uh, you know, sort of following on a series of videos and software. Um, so we, we've always had a practice where we're making and thinking about the built environment, but to accompany it, other um, other strands, I guess, or threads of ways of looking at architecture and thinking about it. It's very fun on one hand to do that work. It is a lot of work. Um, and we spend a lot of time in the office probably uh, being inefficient. This is not a normal, is an unconventional way of working probably. Um, although there are other architects that we have thought a lot about and we, you know, in our way, collaboration is also in our minds thinking that we're kind of collaborating with them um, too, that they are, have come before us. Obviously the Smithsons, Alice and, and, and Peter Smithson, um, or Atelier Bow Wow. Um, I think, you know, the offices that are, and there are many it's, it's, uh, that I could list, but some, those come few to my mind. Um, but, th but that this accompanies the way that, that we would work and think about building um, in part, and this will come out more as I talk, hopefully in a little smoother way, but um, that it's really also about making a bigger conversation, um, a more inclusive conversation, and also space for others to um, come and join us in talking and thinking about architecture together. In some ways, that's what I'm most excited about now today in, in practice. Um, so 
uh, this is the some construction photos, and this is an existing uh, the kind of manor house. Atelier Bow Wow also did a four boxes studio down here. So we were in really good company. Part of also the studio project was to think about the rest of the campus and the space that's left behind. So I'm very interested in how architecture becomes in some ways a focus um, for, for us, for, for users, but also that it can be a background for other things and that it leaves space for others. And this is also part of the collaborative um, thinking, um, I, I think, I'll try to make an argument for that. Um, some of our, our drawings talking about the space, um, something in sections and details, um, but the idea that um, students can um, begin to see through, uh, th see through the space, this is the relationship. So a, a kind of studio space, but housing at the same time. Um, the, the projects in general are in a way very modest. Um, we uh, work with an economy of means. These are very simple uh, cement, uh, cementitious panels separated with a stainless steel channel to allow light uh, to bounce around. Uh, you know, we spend a lot of time looking at other, uh, you know, artists' work, architects' work. I, you know, we really value and appreciate someone like Agnes Martin's work um, that's sort of search for perfection. Um, but obviously there's always imperfections, especially in construction. Um, but that, that idea of the line um, here and um, the large scale windows are something we use a lot in our work. Um, in this case, for the students, it's a way to see each other's work um, through the space and share. Um, the windows then uh, became actually more surface to pin up um, and draw that a kind of full scale light box, um, but outdoor space for rest and leisure. Here you can see a little bit more of the reflection. Um, other spaces, this is a photography studio, so um, it has a screen to make it dark and a relationship to the context. Um, here. True weather. <laughs> And this is what, a little bit what I mean by in the way that we worked on this project and the siding of it, you can see the Jorge Pardo house behind um, these studio buildings in the back that I mentioned in the beginning um, were actually torn down in Tam Vidigar, a Swedish uh, office out of Stockholm, uh, built more studio spaces uh, that are bigger and different. Um, but I, for me, I'm, I'm in a way very proud of this image um, because it lets other um, work happen um, in relation to building. Um, I, I wanted to also present this as a little bit of an older project, but important, I think, in the, our line of work. And, you know, we have thought a lot about the way that we practice and the kinds of things we want to work on and keep working on. This is a, 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 it's a, in the form of a house, but it's a visitor center for a museum, the Museum of Outdoor Arts. Uh, based in uh, Denver, um, that has been supporting artists through their nonprofit, their museum that's a nonprofit, um, and supporting land artists um, for the past uh, 30 years or so. And they invited us to make this visitor center um, on a, a kind of ranch um, in New Mexico, uh, where uh, Charles Ross, he's a New York based uh, land artist, has been building a sculpture since the 1970s. Um, and so they asked us if we could think about the visitor center through the idea of uh, a kind of growth. And we um, started, we had actually two schemes. Um, this is a video or stills of uh, a, a kind of longer house that we proposed. And then this is the house that actually was built. Um, we made two, uh, two videos uh, for this. And the, the models, in a way, I think are... Um, always very large scale. They're also made really with just paper and they're made by hand for the most part. Um, we have been doing other uh, digital forms of modeling, um, but this process is very easy uh, to, to, to make um, in terms of 
no, I shouldn't say it's easy because it's not that easy, but it, it um, uh, basically just a, a kind of paper. It's all um, recyclable. This and this is, you know, more than uh, 10, 10 to 15 years old now, I guess, uh, the kind of image. But it's something we were doing a lot of, the kind of writing stories, um, making videos and, um, uh, you know, kind of also making mock-ups. We made larger scale mock-ups. We made a book also with interviews um, of other, um, uh, other kind of engineers, but also the client um, talking about the importance of um, the idea for people to come together here and um, observe nature and participate and, and look at um, and experience the artwork. Uh, which is still ongoing. I think he hasn't finished it. So it's kind of interesting. Um, it was also important that this is a, a kind of experimental house. It's completely passive off the grid. There's no heating or cooling. Um, everything is very, it's very small. This is about 1200 square feet. Um, the cladding is uh, aluminum shingles and completely recyclable. Um, what, you know, we've been thinking about these um, ideas for a long time and um, all, are always trying to to work on them. You know, uh, the Krabbe's Home, the school also complies fully with Danish energy code, so it's a very strict um, uh, kind of space. And the idea with the, the sort of solar chimney uh, can be open and allow air to move through, so when the doors are open, and the, the window is open, it pulls the air through. Um, we also think a lot about the idea of forms uh, related to uh, kind of history of the American house. And um, I guess, you know, some of the um, roofs, uh, that the fact that they're pitched has really to do with uh, environmental conditions as opposed to making a kind of statement about um, postmodernism. So any, uh, that, that's really the, the kind of driving uh, force of this. But this is a, a house for an artist and uh, a, a kind of writer. Um, the idea is that uh, we had done this, the artist studio a few years before, and if this is to become a kind of foundation for the future, you know, does the house really stay a house when it will no longer be a house? Um, and um, can it start to um, take on different scales of intervention and different kinds of spaces, different time periods, um, and also be something that is relatively easily maintained? Um, so these are some of the um, kind of questions that came up in working on this project. Um, again, it, there's something about using a, an economy of parts here um, that we begin to have more experience with and thinking about um, the, you know, the kind of relationship also to um, building in, um, in the surroundings, a kind of local uh, condition of maybe more agricultural works. Um, I'll talk more about that later. Um, but that this is really very simple um, material that comes in one foot rolls, coils, and is um, applied on site. Mm -hmm. um, a kind of storage or thinking about archive um, for this. Um, kind of at the same time, um, you know, we're we're thinking about um, how to how to work more, uh, in some ways, more efficiently, and yet thinking about ways to um, give more variety in spaces and experiences. And this is a project that we were invited to design a platform uh, for design, which was part of ADO. And Mimi and Eric did the wonderful. Um, renovation of the building and this was to be something that occupied the entry space and so through a series of um, benches um, we um, proposed that a way that they could um, fairly quickly reconfigure their lobby space for a number of different public conditions 
Um, and we studied model, make models. Um, and we also worked with Mary Ping, a fashion designer, slow and steady, slow and steady wins the race, um, to design these work jackets um, that had many pockets and it's a kind of pleated aluminum fabric um, for this. Um, and we've been working with metal for uh, almost 20 years um, in a variety of conditions and scales. They also had asked us to think about giving them some kind of instruction book. And we um, together in the office thought about how we could make a book um, with that. And we invited other people like Enrique Bar uh, Ramirez to write an essay. Um, so it's a kind of perpetual thinking of space and bookmaking. Um, our, you know, we're also working on and thinking about um, how we can more actively uh, engage in public spaces with clients. Um, this is for a younger um, artist and uh, gallery owner um, who had a, a space on the ground floor, um, which was a kind of double height space, um, and wanted to think about how they could um, have both a kind of lived work, but also gallery and um, change the space however they needed for whoever they were going to work with. And um, could we help them think about this and um, try to also make the space um, very, in some ways, very durable, but draws upon things like the existing block wall um, in the space, um, this sort of metal stair um, inserting a mezzanine, right. using a curtain, mm -hmm. curtain like other New York studios, and then ground with a kind of dotted grid. Mm -hmm. um, and thinking about uh, the relationship between design and design objects has also been a kind of running um, thought through the work. And here we were invited um, by uh, to, to think about the space that was not really retail, was not really gallery, but the client who um, was very young um, was very uh, interested in um, trying to make a, a really exceptional space for New York through the, the idea of making objects. And he uh, commissioned uh, many designers to make objects for uh, his space uh, called Chamber. And the Chamber is now on, more online, uh, but this was in the base of uh, Neil Denari's uh, HL23, the bottom of Highline. Um, so it was a little bit of a leftover space. Um, when we arrived at the space, it was uh, completely empty, and um, except the ceiling was full of all the parts for the rest of the building upstairs. And so anytime you see uh, these kinds of lines, uh, that means there's something serving upstairs. And so we had to uh, think about how to, how to, how to deal with that. Um, it's not w that we would have designed that like that, um, but um, then left, uh, you know, sort of created these, these uh, vaults um, and space in the back. And so um, also designing um, pieces for, uh, for the exhibition space um, and things also like just how to make very, very directly um, uh, kind of office space and, and um, storage for that. So, uh, you know, we're always um, making these pieces and we're, we make everything ourselves in a way we have become also fabricators of this work. Um, so there's a lot of thought and thinking when we make something and even, you know, our drawings, we also um, really like to uh, make references to the work that we do as architects. So something very simple like the marble pattern milled on marble, um, but that the wall is adjustable through these um, threaded screws uh, to give uh, more space. Um, as we're working on these range of projects, and Andres already mentioned, um, but we were invited by Mark and Beatrice um, to participate in um, an exhibition um, in um, Istanbul um, on the human, on the human. Um, and we 
had been, and for me, I have always drawn figures uh, in my work, particularly, I guess, uh, obviously, uh, being a woman in architecture, um, the representation of the figure is really important and to me. And um, how we, you know, it, if, if we treat our scale figures badly, I don't know what we're saying about the people who will use our buildings. So I think it's pretty important um, to, you know, to pay some attention to that. Um, but we um, started a project that took also years. These books take a very long time uh, now, and we work with many people on them. It's not just us. Um, and um, basically taking a kind of um, canonical drawings and removing the architecture and, and drawing the, and, and leaving the figure as a kind of collection. So this is an unfinished encyclopedia. This drawing um, is Felix Candela, and it's from Avery Library, part of my work. Also, I'm, I feel I spend a lot of time and I'm very interested in archives. Um, we also had done an exhibition uh, here around um, the, called The Other Architect, that which was from the CCA in Montreal, um, where we worked with many objects that architects had done that are beyond buildings, um, but always thinking about, sorry, I don't know why it's jumping around, uh, uh, but the figures. And for me also, it became a real revelation, too, about figures that are, are not drawn and what we don't show as architects and what we should. And, um, and I, in some ways, it's also an invitation for others to start to think about this uh, more carefully and um, and and expand expand that is also um, quite a wonderful experience in talking with a variety of of people about these scale figures because there are stories, of course, behind them that are getting lost um, over time, and maybe some are very uh, valuable and would be you know it would be great to to document that and talk about them more. Um, I drew this figure when I was at OMA. Um, and uh, a woman sitting in a Martin Van Severn chair. So anyway, someone at rest, but in a really nice piece of furniture. <laughs> um, and uh, anyhow, so that, but that was, you know, uh, more than 20 some years ago. So, okay. Um, as we have been working and thinking about um, projects and um, the kinds of things we want to do, that, that we work in a particular way, that we try to produce a culture within the office um, and that that, um, culture is also about the way we make things, the kinds of things we're making. And we're always thinking about these things together. Um, and, and then now that the conversation, we hope, and will stay working in this way, but has really been expanded to be with other architects. Um, and so this is a housing laboratory. I was in, invited to um, uh, uh, help curate um, and as a kind of competition, a group of architects um, around housing prototypes um, in a way to show um, as a kind of platform for how you could build in Mexico. Um, so um, we were asked to help curate this uh, competition result and also make the education center. So the Laboratorio de Vivienda um, is this building here, this kind of long bar building, very thin. and um, the, a kind of garden of um, um, housing prototypes by 32 international architects. Um, I'd say probably 80% of them have offices in Mexico um, and um, started to think about this. There's, uh, the, originally, the architects were asked to design these um, units that would make up something more of a neighborhood um, not that they're to be built as singular houses. These are not single family houses. I think it's really important to understand the context. Um, but effectively what had been built and you know, was being built in Mexico um, are houses that are more or less all of the same. There's not a lot of thought um, uh, into the, and this I'm talking about kind of mass development, not, not other kinds of things, but um, a kind of lack of... Um, uh, uh, services and also shared spaces. So we thought, although this is a small, relatively small site, we could try to um, aggregate them in a way that would produce shared spaces um, at a smaller scale with smaller elements um, between the houses. Each of the 
Each house is designed for a specific state in Mexico, and Mexico has 10 different microclimates. Uh, so the houses were all designed for a very specific location. Uh, the architects had to then, um, again, redesign uh, this space for this location, which is about a two-hour drive north of Mexico City. So a lot of a lot of work. It was very interesting to me also in the uh, kind of evaluation of the competition entries in that the majority of the Mexican offices had submitted full CDs and some of the American offices were really sketches. And it, it showed, I thought, a, an interesting uh, difference in the relationship to working, uh, to methods, to uh, just a kind of um, a way that we see uh, the world and maybe uh, in different lenses and through different means. And that has really stuck with me. Um, and um, I, anyway, I don't know. It's a maybe I have questions around it, but um, I think that's really important. Again, here, this project um, is a way to sort of move through the space. And the housing is for social, it's their social housing and it's for uh, workers. It's workers housing. Uh, the client was um, a young uh, architect who founded a group uh, within inside uh, Infanavit, which is uh, Mexico's um, social workers uh, uh, mortgage lender. So effectively some, some kind of a bank in a way. Um, but they had agreed to fund this group that then sponsored many uh, design competitions uh, and projects and built many projects during a kind of five-year span. So this is just one of many um, um, public works that were were made, including public spaces. Um, and so the, the education building is really a space for uh, convening conferences and classrooms. Uh, there's store the models and drawings. Um, and uh, there was to be a cafe. And so you can see uh, the kind of space here. Um, this project also um, was a project where we thought a lot about uh, making a book. And as part of the presentation and the research, um, we compiled a book um, with all the other offices. So here we really thought about um, all the conversations we had had. Um, you know, it, took a, it took a while. Um, we spent probably more time in preparing for the construction than the actual construction. So this was a very different experience for us. But um, we had to write and defend why we selected the architects. There were originally almost 100 um, offices that participated. Um, and, you know, um, we maybe could have argued for all of them, but, but we were charged with 32. So anyway, uh, and then we asked all the offices also to write something about what influenced their ideas behind the design so we could um, talk about that a little bit more. Um, this project um, has to do with um, looking at houses and more research, I would say, uh, into um, a kind of selection of houses um, and thinking about them in scale uh, in a more uniform um you know, sort of in a more uniform presentation, um, but then also to highlight in a way, and this is a part maybe for me the most interesting, uh, 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 it is the relationship to materials um, and a kind of selection of those materials um, against the um, houses. And continuing in a way the the research into architecture and and houses, we were, you know, working, as I said, on the CCA, uh, the other architect, and, you know, had this kind of, I think, amazing experience being able to be up close um, with these different objects um, that architects had made and writings and uh, TV shows and uh, these kind of wonderful things. Um, and thinking about how um, this relationship to public um, and to also, um, thinking about children, um, that maybe there could be more um, done to um, talk about that with them. And what, you know, what is the experience um, in sharing architecture um, in a way that talks through the things that we, we like and know how to make, like drawing, like telling stories, 
talking about design. And um, so we had started already thinking about how we wanted to put together a book around making a house. Um, and um, I think also for us, how to expand the canon. I think when we were students, we were very limited in what we were supposed to study. I tell my students this story a lot. Um, and so it's much harder today. You have so many um, choices and you have access to images and information all the time. Um, so in some ways you have to um, understand what you are really interested in and um, try to uh, you know, try try to work with that. So, um, this book became about uh, you know a kind of very um, a direct story about a family looking to buy a house, and instead it turned into a kind of exploration of houses, and then learning about how to build a house, um, and not maybe not just any house. In the end, they decide to sell the house. And um, so the book is really about a search for architecture. Um, we're also continuing the ideas around houses. I think we're we're thinking about this really very seriously, but trying to also question what that means. Um, houses are um, not housing in some ways, and now I'm going to talk about housing soon. Promise. <laughs> um, but in this case, House 10 um, became really a house that has uh, at its heart a kind of square um, cut out. Um, but it's, it's about uh, these sort of uh, pieces, these kind of rectangles that are all the same size, a form and that are relatively the same size, um, aggregated together and reimagined the space for living. So each bar is a room, a kind of kitchen. Uh, three bedrooms and a, another space that could be used for a uh, kind of guest room, uh, a sort of bathroom and the entrance. Um, each of the bedrooms are this exactly the same. And this was something we started to think about through our corridor house um, project that we did for the Chicago Biennial. Uh, in that um, if we really want to be serious about equity issues around equality. I think this has to begin at home and whatever size that might be. And this is something we also try to look at in housing. Um, and so there's no master, right? We get rid of master builder, we get rid of master bedrooms, all of it just goes away um, in favor of other things. And, and living becomes around the courtyard. The house is built um, between uh, a garden in the center uh, and a forest. And so it really becomes a space that is, um, it's for an extended family. It's also for someone who has mobility issues and challenges. And, um, and so really how to, how to reimagine uh, how we live, the usefulness of the spaces. The space became a school during COVID. Um, the space, the house couldn't become many uh, separate rooms. All of the doors slide. So in theory, it could become something else in the future. Um, and, and then there's other just more fun things, too, about the house in terms of color. Architecture for us is, seems to always uh, fall to things being uh, more gray or neutral colors, let's say. And colors really happen in the landscape, in the furniture, um, thinking, about, uh, thinking about that. I think things, too, like research from the corridor house where the whole house was built out of sheets of plywood also happened here, um, where instead of um, uh, cross-framing beams, it becomes this plain uh, details. Lots of color. It's easier to change color than architecture. <laughs> um, things in the garden is really about a kind of medicinal herb, vegetable, um, than so much flowers. I also, um, I wanted to talk a little bit too about nighttime. I think for us, um, we're really interested in architecture and particularly when we talk about things in the public realm, that it is about day to night. And I think we're in a way responding to a time period where renderings were very popular and always seemed to be only at sunset or um, sunny days with blue skies. and um, 
as architects, we have to work with more than that. And um, this is this artist uh, studio, um, by artist uh, James K. Spire, who's also a photographer, um, and, and who works in a way very similar to how architects work. He makes uh, scale models and photographs them. Um, sometimes the models are of spaces and places he has never been, and he um, imagines what they might be like um, at this time. As we were designing this project, we were also working on the a pan at the um, laboratorio, and I was making other trips to Mexico, and he started working on a series around um, uh, Barragan's houses. And, um, you know, he, it was interesting to, to sort of see the, the kind of scale and the detail because it was abstracted and not the same. And um, I thought it was just a very moving. And his work is obviously and called very emotional. And he also rarely ever uses scale figures. So these were some uh, kind of interesting things uh, for me. But part of this project um, in his move out of the city to do his work and make a studio and make a living space kind of combined was also to have a space for community exhibition. So part of this space here um, was to also allow for the public um, or uh, to, to come and see work that he um, uh, curates with, with others. It's not his work, but he's, he's making a space for a community within that, um, trying out different kind of materials, um, different lighting. So some of the, you can see some of the models um, it was also a conversation around, you know, as a photographer, he really wanted a totally dark space. Um, but we, you know, we said, well, you're, you're in this beautiful setting. You should really see it. So um, we had many conversations around that. And, um, you know, ultimately, these sort are of like really small details, but designed uh, a, a way to have a blackout, a blackout shade. But um, Really, for me, the process of working on multiple models at once and going between them and seeing um, how they take shape and what happens to them, um, it, it felt very close to the way that we work um, as architects. Um, <laughs> that's the word. Um, we've also been working on um, a project with Tatiana Bilbao. She um, invited us to participate in also a group project um, with uh, Productura and Macias Paredes um, and um, for St. Louis, um, very close to the Pulitzer Foundation, um, and to design um, a low, um, well, more middle-income house um, for a family or household. Um, and so again, here in our sort of crude drawings, but the bedrooms are, are the same, uh, and which w was really hard to convince them to, do, <laughs> to say, um, because again, that desire of a market and wanting certain things like master bedroom uh, became a challenge for the realtor. How will I sell this if it doesn't have a master, for instance, was one thing um, we were asked about. Uh, but we, we really insisted. We thought it was important. Um, and do think it's important. So this is under construction. Um, there are multiple, each house is built four times over um, within this space. Um, we're, so as we're working on projects, we're doing research, um, doing research uh, with students. And this project, uh, Vacant Spaces, came out of um, kind of a beginning of another um, a longer period of time of research, which really started with the foreclosed show um, at MoMA, which was curated by Ryan Holt, Martin, um, and Barry Bergdahl. And, you know, is something we have thought about uh, for a very long time, that, that whole experience, um, which was really um, incredible for us um, as young architects or younger architects. I don't think of myself as a young architect, but um, and so starting to look at uh, vacant spaces and cataloging this and researching it in New York in relation to uh, the housing crisis. Um, this was assembled all with publicly available information, uh, but New York has something like 55 million square feet of vacant space. Um, and this is a crisis before COVID even, um, but the fact that our zoning and um, doesn't permit housing um, at a lot of the kind of ground floor spaces, um, we thought 
important to look at. You know, New York is, we often celebrate it so much for the skyline, which of course I love too. Um, but the majority of New York is really only two stories. It's in a way radically underbuilt um, and could really be thought of um, much more carefully. And um, so we sort of went neighborhood by neighborhood, um, looked at this, um, collected, you know, things like um, being empty for 638 days. Um, it's just hard to understand how that can be possible um, and what could be done instead. There has to be something um, to try to uh, change that and make opportunities for people to um, occupy those spaces through housing, um, through other needs of the communities. Um, and we did some small design sketches um, just to show what you, maybe you could do. Um, this work is being done at the same time as we're, um, we're invited uh, to work on two affordable um, housing uh, residential buildings uh, in Washington, D.C., um, and uh, at the kind of row house, um, the site was sloped. Um, we had to navigate a kind of staircase um, and very, um, you know, very low budget, very bare bones um, kind of construction. Um, in this and the next project I'll show, we really advocated for a um, variety of, of unit, I, you know, I, I don't want to say types, but units, different kinds of units. Um, and, you know, there are real differences between working on housing in New York City and Washington, D.C. And that was really um, enlightening for, for me, especially to kind of go through that process and see that um, more ideas around um, thinking about households um, and multiple units. Um, and um, in this case, a much larger project. Um, both of these projects um, are... Uh, in neighborhoods um, that the mayor's office picked for sites. And in this case, uh, the line that separates the street is Maryland. So it's the furthest out you could possibly be um, in, in D.C. Um, and so in a way, we were kind of critical of the fact that housing, affordable housing, wasn't located more centrally. Um, this is an hour walk to... Langston Terrace. Um, so that gives you a sense of the kind of location. But um, also a slightly awkward site. Um, we started to think about ways, what we wanted to do most with housing, um, things like single loaded corridors, uh, through views to the apartments from the street to the courtyard, um, to the courtyards we made, kind of ground floor. This is also. Um, for uh, it's 100% affordable housing. Uh, it's 75,000 square feet and um, it has 63 units and 13 are um, for um, the social services. Um, so we had, uh, we worked with the social uh, service provider for the kind of entrance. We can talk a little bit about that process. Um, but in this case, I'm really trying to think about not only who's living here and the experience of walking through the space, this is not a double loaded corridor, um, but um, how, to, how to always have light, at least light, um, trying to get light and air in those spaces, um, but also to think about people working in those spaces. Uh, we spend so much time talking about housing and who lives in the apartments, um, but we know from the past failures of housing, it's also about who maintains the buildings. Um, this building also has a penthouse. This is the penthouse. It's almost unheard of in a way in housing, um, but by the the kind of code um, and, and zoning for DC, we were not allowed to technically have a fifth floor, even though it's the fifth floor, but it was acceptable to have the fifth floor and call it a penthouse. So we were like, okay, that sounds good. <laughs> and, um, we'll do that. So anyway, you get, you know, 100% affordable housing and a penthouse all in one project. It's kind of great. Um, but this, you know, this is sort of building off of ideas from Foreclosed and then also from another exhibition at the Venice Biennial that uh, Monica Ponsilion and Cynthia Davidson curated, um, where we also made a book um, and, and wrote um, about a, a kind of housing and 
um, use. So it just, this, in a way, again, the kind of repetition of things. This was originally the model, um, and we made really, really large windows, like really large. We knew there was no way this would be happen to be built, but we knew that if we didn't do this, if we did exactly what they said, um, they would make them even smaller. And so we said, we're going to just do this and not say anything. Um, and so, of course, it got value engineered and the windows wound up being smaller, but these are still much bigger than what they usually build. Um, and we, um, you know, we were able to do that, I think. And um, the... You know, the the windows also are, or the building, sorry, the apartments are um, a single uh, a studio up to four bedroom. So a much bigger, uh, or, sorry, a much uh, more diverse uh, set of things than typical, um, and particularly in New York. So just by comparison, uh, just a few more and I'm almost done. Uh, this was a competition we recently uh, finished. Um, sorry, there's going to be a lot of green here. <laughs> um, in uh, Paraguay, um, we were invited to submit for an international housing competition. This is in uh, Chacarita um, in Asuncion. And um, uh, and so we we collaborated with Quipo de Arquitectura and uh, Dalmo Faden's office. Um, we were based in um, Buenos Aires. Um, and the, the, our three offices work together, um, collaborating on this um, this housing, residential building, set of buildings. Um, it's a very prominent site. It's a site that has been occupied for a long time. All of the residents were interviewed. Um, some chose not to go forward and were, were relocated. Um, others said they wanted to be part of, the, part of this and um, were interviewed and everything was designed according to um, their requests for what they wanted in um, their units. Um, we tried to put everything, consolidate the housing to make some density, um, to also think about the way that um, public space works and particularly in um, a kind of neighborhood residential area. We wanted them to have, we wanted the residents to have access to outside space, to have some shared space, um, but also to be able to maintain that space. So um, that's part of the um, the form. It's a kind of intense site, um, so a lot of site work um, required. Um, and one way, it, it's a very low, um, sort of low-tech project, but um, strangely high-tech. We got this very detailed drone imagery um, sent to us, so, so we had never <laughs> experienced something like that before um, in the work. Um, Okay, and then um, I think I'll, I'll sort of try to wrap up. I have just a couple more things. We also work um, more and more on, on the kind of metal work and through objects and furniture um, and working with Monera, which is a gallery in Brussels that works with architects almost exclusively. And, um, you know, thinking about um, projects that we can make that are part of, um, you know, in this case, trying to think about making a public space outside um, and bringing people together um, through this, through, 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 okay. And um, maybe just two more. So uh, this is recently, we just finished building this greenhouse clinic. Um, and this was for um, a, a triennial in Guangzhou. Um, right now it's built inside a museum, but I'm working on finding a home for it in a public space, I think would be great. The sign comes off so it can be um, just a structure and we can talk about that later. But I really um, started uh, thinking about the way that, um, you know, we tend to use spaces in certain ways um, and have a sort of fixed way of thinking about them. And I, you know, have been teaching these seminars on clinics um, and health for quite a long time. Uh, and the challenge around going to a clinic and, you know, the kind of embarrassment maybe people feel like they don't want to go into a building that has a sign on it that says clinic and yet go to a greenhouse and there's no question around that. And um, maybe it's a little idealistic to say that, you know, we could make this space and expect people to come to it. But 
it's more of a just a kind of provocation. Can we start to break down how we think about types and things and um you know what what could those be? A part of that comes out of maybe looking at the work of someone like Alison Smithson, Peter Smithson that did a clinic uh, for a company on occupational hazards. And in that in that clinic space, they had a gallery um, devoted to uh, sort of work hazards. And it was just a very unexpected uh, kind of condition um, and something I was interested in trying to work with here. So um, it's a very simply made um, parts. It's all recyclable. It comes apart easily. Um, this was put together in just a few days. And this is really something that we've thought a lot about over the years of doing these variety of biennials, um, because often you're invited to make these projects and, you know, that what happens to them and um, they, you know, they come down and they're maybe thrown away or you have no control over them as an architect. And we thought, well, at least we could start to make things um, that we knew what could happen to them. Or we, if we had to, we could take control of them more easily. So things like recycling and making things in part. So everything out of aluminum um, is what happens. And a lot of the work now that we're looking at, so Petita Pool, um, we were invited to, um, with the director um, of the, of the biennial uh, and the Ansav School of Architecture to design a pavilion for children to um, learn about design, children, teenagers. Um, and so this is, we made this proposal. The, the height is really scaled for kids, so only kids can fit under, and they have a very different relationship to, to the structure um, here. And um, we also started to think a lot about what this means. And again, like all of these projects and for many of you in your offices, we all have these ideas and not, not all of them become real, but they can move on to other things and create space and a, a way to invite others to participate. So we started to think through this process of um, how, well, how would you make a design assignment for someone here in this space? And we started to ask other architects and designers to write design assignments, um, and which started, which then became a book. Um, but different, you know, these different kinds of spaces that are over the years um, have been occupied with other kinds of objects and things, things to make. Um, we originally, this was supposed to be up for six months. Uh, it's my understanding it's still up. So it's almost five years. So we're really um, proud of that, um, that it's used. It was used during COVID. Um, and this became then a book um, about making it. Um, so again, we're really interested in this idea of making and collaboration and um, how, how, how what we do is in a way background sometimes for, for other things. So I think with that I'll end. Thank you. First, something very maybe uh, minor, but for me it's yeah. very exciting. Uh, the way, there's two things that I love in the way that you represent architecture and, yeah. and present it here. The first is the this light thing, like you're mm -hmm. occupying that space that is almost mm -hmm. dark, not yet, or already kind of racing somehow, like it's, it's early in the morning, late in the afternoon, something like that, mm -hmm. uh, that you mentioned. Uh, and also this kind of confetti feeling that there's there's been a party or it's uh, or it's like the remains of these things. Like it yeah. feels really like there's <laughs> dust around the uh, stones, uh, the leaves yeah. Yeah. left there. Uh, I have the feeling that it seems to be uh, either not yet ready or yeah. or too late. It's too early, too late when we arrive to see your projects. And I have the feeling that there's so much that your space that your projects are leaving for. Uh, this maintenance or things mm -hmm. to be built or things to be completing the work of the architects. And somehow it feels that there's that space that is given to others. And uh, you always talk of doing architecture in the company of others. And I wonder what's kind of the way you prepare for those other participations to happen through your architecture. Yeah, I thank you. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I think we're, we're, we're making things all the time and thinking about um, you know, how the spaces might be used and, 
we can't always know who uses the spaces, right? And um, it's a way to acknowledge that right. and think about, um, yeah, that we're just making things for other people all the time. And sometimes these things are, um, you know, not not a service, but um, it is, we are still in service um, in some ways. And maybe we don't talk enough about that. And um, I think if we want to really make architecture that's radically inclusive or it can can be that that has to seep into everything we do maybe or at least that could be a goal <laughs> when you talk about the project that you've been doing uh in mexico the laboratorio de vivienda you just said that the architects coming from the u.s were working differently to those from mexico uh that some of the, they were bringing more sketches versus mexico or architect space in Mexico that were so yeah. maybe you can tell us more about that. Yeah, I mean it's a, I, you know I think it's maybe has to do a lot with the way that we work here and the expectation of how we work and that there it, it's very um, you know where there are the five phases and we're expected to do certain things in a particular order um, and um, maybe also if you are you know not sure. The extents of that you don't do as much. I, I'm not sure, but there is definitely there was definitely a difference in the work and the presentation in the documentation that was submitted. And um, I just I just found that to be very interesting. And in our experience of working when we started working on um, I'm sorry uh, Krabbe's home, uh, you know, Kurt Feinstein said to us, you know, I only need you to present uh, the kind of list of materials that you want yep. to work in. I don't need renderings. Yep. And um, just tell us what you won't work in. And at the same time, we were working on another project and we were asked to just make as many renderings as we could, <laughs> you know. And we were like, wow, this is incredible. And, um, you know, so, and so in a way from there, these, these very international experiences have allowed us to think very differently about how we work and the things that are asked of us. And I think we have always, you know, sort of um, uh, tr just tried to imagine different ways of working. And this gave us more, um, you know, m more um, ability and yeah. encouragement, uh, maybe, and also being inspired to 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 push more on on certain things. Now, how much, how important is being for you and for kind of the network of people you are in conversation with uh, to have sort of a uh, uh, common discussion. I'm thinking that there's names that keep coming up to your work, like yeah. Tatiana Bilbao, Adamo Fiden, Productora. Yeah. There's a network of people that are either in Argentina or in Mexico or yeah. in Europe yeah. that that in Japan that somehow are part of a cohort. And I have the feeling that that's very different to other ways of being a yeah. practitioner that doesn't seem to be a sort of a competition but something different maybe another form of competition but but something that somehow it's uh building a dialogue between colleagues or or a sense of colleague right yeah totally and uh, you know i think in a way this began in part i mean as i said michael and i were always two never less than two right um but from the time we were part of the um ordos 100 Yep. And with Jacques Herzog and Ai Weiwei kind of curating this group of architects, um, many of us, of course, stayed in touch and um, colleagues and friends. And um, as, and there, so there, there's sort of that through through Moss, but also through teaching. I mean, I have an amazing uh, kind of cohort I'm always working with, uh, in, particularly in the housing studio. Um, but I, so the conversations are, are never alone, I feel like. I mean, I have my opinions, of course, and thoughts, but I... I, I I am more interested in a way to to have a culture of of conversation and um, be able to engage that, and I think that's really important. And I feel also the students on this generation and the last few have been very interested in that as well. We're not seeing um, you know necessarily partners, but larger groups forming together and making practices. And I think it's very exciting, and it's very it's a very different thing from maybe our generation, you know. So. I, I love the project in Paraguay, and I, there's something that I, I find very interesting, this idea of the public as an extension of the of, of domesticity. 
uh, actually, when we look at your work, there's always, there's, there's all this kind of house number one, house number two, or three, four, 16. Uh, and um, they they share something that they, when they're represented, they, they seem to be expanding somehow. But mm-hmm. I think this expansion is different. The one in Paraguay, uh, it's not a kind of uh, single family unit. No. Uh, but this collective housing also is uh, in very, uh, let's say, uh, different situation or conditions. That it's it's really kind of social housing, uh, and re- right. relocation of people that were 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 living actually probably in formal yeah uh, settlement in the way, and and the houses are actually constructed the infrastructure of the of the of the area right of the public space. No, I think there's there's a very different moment for your work there. Like the expansion that you were talking about, for instance, in this house, this beautiful house of the of the where you discuss equity and mm-hmm. you you were talking of the medicine kind of plants, the mm-hmm. medicinal plants that but here is something different. It's not like the the expansion of the individual, but rather something that is produced collectively by all these houses being expanding outside, right? You know, I wonder what's that meaning for your work. Yeah. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, I think, well, we'll see. I mean, it's a um, challenge, but it is a conversation amongst many. Um, and, um, you know, the, you know, it's ch- very challenging housing in general, um, because often, um, let's say the projects in D.C., we don't know who's going to live there. Yep. In this case, this was very different. So a lot of it was driven by the requests of the users and, um, you know, that also trying to ask about having these relationships to exterior space and um, also being set, told maybe, no, we shouldn't do that. Or so to say, but it could be a really good idea and, and, and trying to ask for that. So the, the relationship to outside space um, in that way at the ground, at the roof, at each kind of level um, offered, hopefully in a way that was in some ways at more equity in, than what would normally have been perhaps. I don't how do you see yourself as a practice that, and sort of a cohort of people in conversation that started your your office in the early 2000s, at least yeah. the 2003, right? And, yeah. and very soon, a few years later, there was the financial crisis and the, the evicted mm-hmm. crisis. And yeah. working on housing means something very particular for, for people that actually learn how to work on housing those crises, right? And then we saw many other crises come in. Mm-hmm. Uh, however, you're, you're, uh, mm-hmm. there's sort of a, a way for you to register that. I think your work on care, for instance, is definitely working on that. And mm-hmm. and somehow in parallel, there's also more of a reflection architecture. I'm thinking, for instance, mm-hmm. of your book on this family, finding a house, mm-hmm. saying, uh, yeah. selling the... <laughs> The uh, the Malaparte, the real Malaparte, and the and the and the. Uh, how do you see these different ways of uh, orbitating around the issue of dwelling mm-hmm. uh, uh, happening, uh, both as a discussion among peers and as a broader uh, kind of yeah. uh, struggle for societies yeah. uh, converging in these different lines of work in, in your in your practice or research and all together? Yeah, I think. Well, I mean the. I guess it's also, in some way, maybe I'll, it's the different scales. Your question, you're asking about different scales in a way, too. The different scales of working, but different scales of the conversation. And, um, you know, the, the Houses for Sale book, um, in a way, at the same time, is really understanding how uh, you have to work to build housing yep. in this country is very challenging. Um, it's overly onerous. I think we're, don't um, as architects, you never meet the underwriter who, um, you know, says whether or not they're going to give the funds to the developer to build the project. I find really troubling, and so as a way, you know, houses for sale is um, an antidote in some ways on a day to day of practice to that um, to not lose sight of the things that um, you know. And and I think also just we're always uh, I'm, for me too. I'm always learning every single day. Um, I can't learn enough about things, I feel like. Um, and so um, it, it is a, a real struggle in the process of housing and making housing. I think it's um, it's it's challenging. And with the students, we are always um, trying to address that, but not lose sight of the fact that it's our role as architects to be really optimistic 
and to be knowledgeable and to try to design the best things we can without sounding kind of like a cliche. But that is, um, you know, really our work. And um, sometimes it can come down to just knowing ways to get make bigger windows. But um, but it, it's it's a lot more than that, obviously, yep. and particularly in dealing with um, not dealing, but with working with um, communities um, of vulnerable people and, um, you know, what they need in those and learning how to ask for things, honestly, as an architect and particularly in, in um, the residential projects like the one in D.C. because it was not so easy to access social services and to know what they need. Um, and I part of that then led me to, you know, I wrote a text around, let's say, staircases um, and, you know, I was thinking about Ed and Giuseppe, I included their work in that um, project and a writing project and, um, you know, just how to um, try to at least go after one part of this equation, which is so overly complicated here. You were telling me before that now you're very excited about publicness, yeah. working with public, right? With the yeah. public, with the pub, with public space and beyond, right? Right. Uh, what took you there? Well, I think, I mean... But, you know, it's very, uh, yeah, I don't want to keep saying it's really hard as an architect because it seems um, we all know that. But, uh, you know, to start in the U.S. Um, and at least in our generation really was about starting in small ways and houses. And then you, you know, you have supposed to have this practice where you build up and scale incrementally, um, you know, in other places around the world. Maybe there are more opportunities for competitions uh, and things uh, to do it, to work at a, at a bigger scale. Um, and so I... You know, it's not that I didn't want to work in the public, um, but it's it's not um, it's not that easy. And as you mentioned, all these different crises, um, you know, you get to a certain point and then something happens and sort of undoes that work. And so, um, you know, the books are one way to also begin to um, yeah. show the kind of interest and um, expertise, what have you, or opening more so opening the conversation. So the interest in the public is also about that, too, that it's yeah. it's beyond many scales of public, I think. Uh, books and paper and things moving from one media to another. Yeah. Because I think there's a lot there, right? Like yeah. you're taking things from one media, putting them in another, making them go back to the universal. <laughs> and you can basically take things from reality to the rocks and then you put them in your yeah. drawings and then the rocks end up being a rendering on a fabric and in a chair and all becoming kind of a, a cushion. Yeah. I think there's so much moving from one place to another. And I think the paper, actually, that's something that you love because in a yeah. way it allows you probably to move things easily from one. Right. But there's very specific projects that come out of that. I, I love the scale figures, uh, the project, yeah. because it very literally is bringing things to, to the one-to-one -one scale. And then we see what means to be uh, excluded through architecture and what are the bodies that are produced through architecture. And that was actually... Right, that it was in the in the Istanbul Biennial. I remember in the actually it was in the studio. It's right. It was on there. Yeah, yeah. Very beautiful. And basically, we would enter the room, and there would be these scale figures, and it was monstrous in a not necessarily good way. Like to see how architects were depicting the humor, right? And the right. and what's what was missing there, and there was a tension there, but also beauty in the way that it was done yeah. with this kind of magic language of the silk and the sure. and and I think there's something of this delicacy of how things move to from one place to another that gives some space yeah. to suspend a little bit the judgment for a while until we understand what's happening, right? And something like that, that I have the feeling that is very important for you, right? Yeah, yes. totally. <laughs> uh, uh, when you saw today the drawings, I saw that uh, you have redrawn many things, right? Like I remember a lecture that, that uh, you gave with Michael in Princeton right after you published the, the blue book of your uh, words and all the projects were done in colors and with you know, a huge life around that. Somehow today you were presenting other drawings, right? That were with black line uh, on a white yeah. background. I wonder yeah. why. Yeah. And that's a good checkpoint, right? To put it all many things to. Yeah, I think we're just always experimenting. I think to how to have an unconventional practice and challenge the way that. There are certain expectations around drawing and what we should do and some way also about, um, I guess I'm, I'm interested in that architecture, there should still be a surprise somehow when you see it also in person, that this expectation that the rendering tells us everything. Um, I think we should 
we should still have delight and surprise. And so maybe there's a kind of reductiveness in the drawing and the plan um, because it's really a placeholder for other things to come. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe we can open it now. Uh, there's many things already. Valerie, you want to stop here and then you? Up front. Up here first. Hi. Thank you for uh, the beautiful presentation, inspiring, uh, inspiring projects. Uh, so I have a question about the way you design. So you often work on well-known and established uh, uh, topologies and uh, your projects are often an experiment uh, to subvert these typologies. When I say typologies, I mean both uh, spaces, objects, but also the way users inhabit uh, um, uh, these spaces, these objects. Uh, I refer to the pitched house, to the school and the courtyard. So my question is, can we say there is a poetic of subversion in your work? And if so, can you talk about it? Can you talk about design as a, a subversive uh, action? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I take that. That sounds good. I mean, I, yeah, I, I, yes, I think so. Um, I would agree with that. I, I don't know about talking about it exactly. <laughs> I think we just do it. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't say um, we set out to. We don't openly say, okay, let's today we're going to subvert, you know, right? But. Um, you know, maybe it's more of also just, again, like thinking through things we know and trying to learn more things. And, um, yeah, I think, you know, being critical, too, of the world we're in and the things we often have to do as architects or these expectations, like I said, of like, OK, we make a house, but now the realtor has to sell it. Well, <laughs> of course they do. Everyone has, you know, we have to get paid and um, we're not trying to say not to do that. but. Um, but, I, you know, we, we should look at things new and differently. I don't mean, yeah. Uh, hi, um, uh, my name is Nick. I'm an admitted student. I, so not here yet, but I, I really enjoyed your talk. Uh, you mentioned briefly um, about journalism and its similarity to architecture. And that I found that really engaging, like architecture as a, a method of investigation and, and investigation as a method of architecture. And I wonder how you as an architect and, and me as an aspiring architect should go about investigating it, it, as an idea before design or in the process of design. And how do you do that when you know the communities you're designing for? But then you also mentioned like in DC, when you don't know the communities you're designing for, or when you're designing for communities that have been excluded from those spaces, like especially if like I'm from, I live in the Bay right now, and there's so many people haven't been allowed to live there because of the crisis. There's not enough housing. How do you design as an investigation designed with community process involved when those people are being excluded from the space? Yeah. yeah, I think that's a great question. I mean, I think that's something we talk about all the time here at the school. And, you know, architects um, often have, are, are in these situations of extraction. And how do we, as, uh, you know, we're doing our work, not do that? Um, so I think this is a large part of what we talk about here at the school in the design studios and and then in our office, and particularly in dealing, in, sorry, I don't mean keep saying dealing, but uh, in in working um, on the housing work, um, has been about engaging directly with uh, residents or future residents um, of of these particular buildings, and you know, in some cases, it means sitting in people's living rooms and hearing really what they want and. Um, I know I, it's it's hard for me to think about other professions where you do that, right? Um, and so I think you you that's what's also very exciting in a way about the work. It's challenging, but it takes you to many different places. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like people sorry, talk to people like um, unhoused people who are maybe you're like you're building a, a affordable housing place. People on the street or people. With disabilities that have consistently had housing not designed to fit them. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Other questions, one here? Yeah. Sure, sure. 
Hi, thanks so much for your talk. Um, it was really cool. Um, my name is Jazz. Um, so architectural writing can often be really exclusive um, and we can often use language as architects that excludes people and your work is really involved in participation and things like that. So um, what do you think about when you are making your books, um, especially like the Petite Ecole, um, uh, how, how do you, how, what are you thinking um, to make, to make um, the more accessible for like children, um, non-professionals, and also um, in your process, where does the book making come? Does it come after? Or is it, um, are you thinking about it during the process? Yeah. Yeah, thank you for the question. I think, um, I mean, for Petite Cole, because we were asked to design the school space for children to learn about design, um, the idea was that we were going to also teach workshops and curate and, and it was more than just the structure, but then COVID happened. Um, so that stopped um, us, our ability to, to go there, obviously. And um, so we had already assembled a lot of material and we said, okay, let's just imagine we're doing what we would do if we could go in person. So that, that became the book. Um, and in each of the books, we are inviting other people to contribute. And um, this has gone back to um, uh, some of the other books like the Blue Book um, that you mentioned, Andres. And, um, you know, and one of the things we say is we want you to write about architecture. It's not just about us. Um, we're not interested necessarily. You, know, you don't have to say something about our work, but say something about architecture. That's the most important. So in, in that case, the the public is maybe more architects. Um, but, um, you know, I think the, the, you know, the Houses for Sale book, for instance, is um, through the CCA in Montreal and also Carini Press, um, which is um, Bruno Minari's publisher. So, you know, we're opening, trying to open up more to other designers um, too. So, um, and Vacant Spaces um, is, again, another audience. Maybe. So I think for us, we're just, there's, we're, we're trying. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you so much. I think that it's phenomenal that uh, you are giving today this presentation and this conversation in the context of open house, uh, just because I think that the word uh, inclusion came out many, many times, uh, uh, I would like to ask you in, in light of the variety of, uh, phases in which you actually engage the process or engage the actors within the process, uh, both in terms of relationships that you establish or in terms of your role, say up to the fabrication, uh, phase of material, which somehow covers the full arch from, you know, initial provocation, concept, desire to actualization. But then also at the level of uh, architecture, for example, the use of the courtyard in your uh, non-master bedroom house and the role of the courtyard as opposed to the single loaded corridor for something that is in collective in DC. So I think that if it were possible to draw a map of, say, the conventional way in which the process from conception to actualization and use were diagrams, so to speak, I think that you cover so many spots <laughs> and ways of somehow producing engagement. Yeah. So I would like just to ask you, can you phrase in your own words the relationship between inclusion and engagement oh, I don't I'd have to think about it for a little while I don't, I'm not, I'm not. well they're, yeah they're yeah. <laughs> yeah. right I mean I think we uh, we're always thinking about both of those things at the same time. I don't know. Um, 
yeah, I'm interested in both of those things very much. So, um, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure what more to say. I, um, yeah, we think about it and opportunities to make things. Um, and that includes making space for many things. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 And the many people we are talking to. And I think also, you know, we're, um, you know, we really appreciate are all of the things we've been able to do and our uh, relationships and experiences. And so I think, you know, how to, you know, in some ways it's, um, you know, we want to keep doing it and do more of it. And um, we're really interested in, in what other people are doing too. So I don't know, you know, just making space. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Hello. Thank you so much for the for your presentation. Um, first, I want to talk about a little bit about what I'm interested in and kind of give your advice on um, what. So my thesis was based on um, making an architecture and um, how we need to rethink architecture in office, studio, and home. And um, I created this like prototype where it's a studio desk on wheels. And um, I'm very um, passionate about all of that. And um, how could I like further all of that through, you know, some sort of organization and um, teamwork with other people and collaborating? Or how did you start collaboration through, um, you know, your making and through like the books and your office and your representations. <laughs> it's a good question. You're asking the right. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know if it's how do you how do you interesting collaborate. How do you make it possible? Do that. Yeah. Or I can't fall in all these ways yeah. of collaborating with others. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, now I'm I'm just thinking like, what does the desk look like? What is it made of? What do you do at the desk? Or I don't know, on the desk, under the desk, whatever. But, um, and, you know, can you make a model, photograph it, write an essay, um, ask other friends to help you? Um, uh, how much can you sell it for? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, um, these, uh, how, can you make more of it? Do you need a patent? I don't know. Sorry. Cause it's like, these are the thoughts I have, but I, I put, yeah, try to do all of those things. <laughs> um, oh, I think it sounds great, actually. <laughs> yeah, desks on wheels. We need that upstairs. <laughs> this, this sounds like a good moment to do that. Uh, thank you so much, Hillary. Uh, this was amazing. Thank you.